Welcome to Microsoft Flight Simulator and VR, but not as you may know it. I'm using no peripherals, no mouse, and no controllers other than my hands. No fancy gloves or anything, just my bare hands. And today I'm using the HP Reverb G2. The best bang for your buck VR headset you can get right now. And to enable hand tracking in VR, I'm using one of the extended features in the OpenXR Toolkit application. To enable the hand tracking, I'm using a Leap Motion controller and supporting software from a third-party developer called Ultra Leap. They used to be called Leap Motion, but changed their name some years ago. I recently produced a six-part series on VR in Microsoft Flight Simulator, Virtual Reality Essentials. No hype, no spin, just what you need to know to get you up and running in Windows Mixed Reality. If you want to know more about the OpenXR Toolkit or any other aspect, link in the notes below. In my video, Cockpit Interaction, where we looked at various different ways of interacting in VR in the cockpit, we briefly touched on hand tracking. There was quite a lot of interest in this topic, so in a way this video is a follow-on from that video. I'm no expert by any measure on this subject. This is my first look and my first experimentation in Microsoft Flight Simulator. I will of course be doing future tests as well as configuration changes. These are fairly time consuming activities so if you're interested in seeing videos on my future developments please let me know in the comments below. Also don't forget to subscribe and hit that thumbs up if you like this sort of thing. Warm welcome to the Sim Hangar. My name's Mark. Thanks for watching and let's get started. Let's start off with the OpenXR Toolkit. This is a third-party freeware application that enhances the VR experience in Microsoft Flight Simulator. From the main page on their website, under Features, we can find a separate category covering hand tracking and the requirements needed to enable it for both Pimax, Vojo Aero and Windows Mixed Reality headsets. It also details what controllers are supported, which includes the Leap Motion Controller or Ultra Leap Controller, and provides a link to two essential pieces of software that need to be downloaded. The first is the Ultra Leap Tracking Software for the Leap Motion Controller itself, and the Ultra Leap OpenXR Installer to provide compatibility with the OpenXR application which includes a configuration utility allowing you to modify and adjust the settings for the hand tracking and the hand gestures that activate various actions. It comes with a default profile for Microsoft Flight Simulator, which is what I'm using today. And as mentioned previously, it's only Windows Mixed Reality we'll be covering in this video. And what does it do? Well, it provides interface to the sim, exactly as if you had controllers in your hands using only your hands. The Leap Motion controller is fairly well established in the VR market and quite a few headsets already have the unit built in. Installing the two pieces of software is fairly straightforward, relatively small programs and for me they installed no issues at all. Both pieces of software are fairly mature. You can get confirmation of successful installation by going to Microsoft's OpenXR Tools for Windows Mixed Reality and checking under API Layers. The top entry is the OpenXR Toolkit and the second entry is the Ultra Leap Controller. So what is this controller? Well, it's a fairly straightforward device with two cameras, which in native mode provide pass-through but not in SIM, and a sensor. And it's this unit that tracks your hands. Pass through is where you can see the world around you. It's a relatively small piece of kit, can be mounted in various different ways, including to your headset, which I'll be showing shortly. You do need to be cognizant of its limitations in terms of its field of view or FOV, but again, we'll be able to see that in action shortly. Let's take a quick look at the controller itself. The cost for this unit is around about 110 US dollars excluding shipping costs. It's an understandable robust unit with an aluminium frame and it's not very heavy at all. And it comes with two cables, a short cable for those headsets that have got a inbuilt USB connector and a longer cable for connection to PC. It's a proprietary connection one end and standard USB the other. 
from what I can remember, I've had my unit for five or six years or more. A small plastic mounting frame is available for an additional cost and is designed to make fitting on the front of a VR headset simple and straightforward. It's a snug fit into a plastic case, then a separate bracket which fits onto the VR headset and it simply slides and clicks in. For today's demonstration, I attached a unit to the front of the HP Reverb G2. Bearing in mind the limitations of the FOV, you can also have it flat on the desk in front of you, or alternatively mounted on your monitor. With my mounting as shown, I was concerned it would interfere with the tracking of the headset, but that didn't appear to be the case. It is important you keep the glass frontage of the controller clean, or that can interfere with tracking. One observation I did note was the unit gets quite hot. For our test today, we're going to be trying it out in the Cessna Citation Longitude. Once you've completed the installation and before you jump into the sim, make sure the Ultra Leap control panel is ticked in the Open XR Toolkit menu. The Ultra Leap control panel itself will be available via the taskbar. Note these are controls only for the Leap Motion controller, not for hand tracking per se. Depending how you've got it mounted, a number of options available. Camera can be normal or inverted, and you can use one or both cameras. You can also determine which tracking mode you want to use. Desktop, VR head mounted, or mounted on top of your screen, or monitor. There's also an option to show the service info, and this is where you can get additional help, documentation, as well as view logs in case you're having problems. We can exit here, and lastly we can have a look at the settings, and here obviously make sure OpenXR support is enabled. Remember we installed two pieces of software? This is the OpenXR Hand to Controller Config. This is default, but it comes with a default profile for Microsoft Flight Simulator, which you can load, called FS2020 Config. This is the Offsets tab, where you define two primary functions, Grip and Aim. Under the Bindings tab, this is where you link hand gestures to actions. For my test today, I've left everything at default. The next tab is Gestures, and in simple terms, this is where you adjust the sensitivities between the hand gestures and the actions to be taken. It's clear to me a fair amount of experimentation and adjustment will be needed to fine-tune everything as required. Just bear this in mind when we see the demonstration. I've left everything at default. There are a number of links to assist you, including primary controller actions, as well as a mind-boggling array of different parts of the hand that can be configured and identified by the tracking software. Yeah, that's a little bit more detail than we need at this stage. You need to activate hand tracking in the OpenXR Toolkit menu by hitting Ctrl F2. Make sure experimental settings are enabled and also show expert settings under the menu tab. Once that's done, let's head over to the inputs tab, where there are a number of other options available for us. Under controller emulation, here we can turn hand tracking off, both hands, just the left hand or just the right hand. You can also change the color and intensity of the hand skeleton. This is the default Ultra Leap hand skeleton. It would be great if the developers could enhance this in some way in future developments. Whilst it is very functional, I'd like something that looks more like a hand. For my initial test, I've chosen New Zealand. It's the South Island, and we're on the runway at Queenstown. As mentioned earlier, we're in the Cessna Citation Longitude. It has a good selection of different buttons, switches, and controls to test out our hand tracking. As the skeletal hands are an overlay, just like the OpenXR menu, this has been recorded using the VR mirror, as they don't show up on a normal recording. So if you see any hesitation or any juddering, it's a result of the recording. My experience in sim and in the VR headset was super smooth. Hand tracking did not seem to have an impact on frame rates. Welcome to the cockpit. And to start off, let's just check that the hands are being tracked. That's the right hand. And now for the left hand, let's make sure that's also being tracked, which it is. The active hand is the one with the white arrow showing. I can swap hands using a clench fist gesture. The active hand also has a pointer showing. We can get rid of this by touching our two index fingers together. Now we just have the white arrow without the pointer. The pointer is very useful for reaching things that are further away. 
You'll also note that the controllers are showing below the skeletal hands. This is the default Open Exile Toolkit status. At the beginning of this video, you'd have seen hands without any controller showing. This is a mod. It's from Flowbud. It's freeware and available on flightsim.to. And it works great with hand tracking. For this demonstration, I've left everything as default, although I much prefer it without the controllers showing. When you touch something you can interact with, it will turn blue. You can grab it using a pinch gesture, and once you've gripped it, it then turns yellow. I'm now just exercising the yoke. You've got to be careful to maintain your finger position to continue to hold on to the item. Change the active hand to the right hand, and let's now move the throttles. Both throttles are moving together by default, which certainly makes life a lot easier. Let's try the spoiler or air brake. Turns blue, pinch, and you could see I thought I had it and I didn't. I can probably improve on the accuracy by changing the sensitivity, but it can make getting hold of something quickly fairly awkward. Let's give it a test now on some buttons. This is done by pointing and then moving the index finger down to activate. Again, these settings are at default, but I am having to concentrate on my finger positions to make sure the relevant actions do take place. I will say, however, that the individual finger tracking does seem fairly accurate. But if you cross your hands, you will lose tracking. Or move them out too far to the side, again, you will lose tracking. The controller has a limited FOV. Rather than a button or a switch, let's try a dial now. The action is the same for a button. In effect, I need to grip it, make sure it turns yellow, and then just rotate my wrist, my hand, left and right to turn the dial. It's a bit finicky, but it does work. Well, the best test, I guess, is to fly this thing. Let's take the handbrake off. There we are. Now you can activate both hands at the same time, which we'll try once we're up in the air. But again, you've got to keep your field of view in mind. Move your head and you could lose control. Anyway, throttles forward all the way. I'm using my left hand to control the yoke. I have tried both hands, but it's a little bit erratic. Speed currently 75 knots. Once we get up to speed, I'm going to pull back on the yoke and we should be up and away. I need to concentrate on where I'm going. I'm so busy looking at the controls, I'm not looking at the runway. The speed's about right now, so time to start pulling back on the yoke. Up we go. Yes, we're up. Maintaining control on the yoke. That worked quite well. Speed now building, uh, 190 knots. And now time for me to get my gear up. For that, I'm going to change control to my right hand and use the pointer to move the gear up. I've now activated the pointer, highlight the gear, bend the index finger to activate, and gear's now going up. There's a fair amount of one-handed operations going on here. Note this is probably due to my inexperience and not being familiar with the hand tracking functions, rather than a limitation of the hand tracking itself. Well, a little bit late, but better late than never. Let's get the flaps up. There we go. I'm climbing a little bit fast at the moment. I need to come back on the throttles and push the nose down a little bit. There's my master caution coming on. Pulling back on the throttles now. We can get rid of that master caution now. We know what the problem was. And now let me reduce the rate of climb and just push that nose down a little bit more and we'll start banking to the left. This part of New Zealand has just beautiful scenery. I'm using live weather by the way. Now experimenting with dual controls, dual hand controls, whilst the yoke is yellow, changing control to the right hand and exercising the throttles. So it can be done, but I do find it a little bit awkward. Now we're over speeding, let's pull on the speed brake or spoiler. After a hectic couple of minutes, which I'll spare you from, let's now see if we can activate the autopilot. 
and autopilots now on. Basically, if you can interact with something using the mouse, well, you can interact with it using the controller. Here I'm interacting with the Garmin using the pointer. A little difficult sometimes to keep the pointer in the right position, particularly if it's turbulent, but it can be done. If I tap my left wrist, this will take me directly to the menu. Once in the menus, again activating, I'm able to navigate around. One point to note is that the Leap Motion controller does not show up as a separate device, or it hasn't for me, in the control options. Tapping the wrist will bring me back into the sim. So what are my feelings and views following my first test of hand tracking in the OpenXR Toolkit in Microsoft Flight Simulator? Well, as you saw, it certainly does work. And I acknowledge I need to do some tweaks and changes to make it more responsive in the cockpit. But I did find it clunky and awkward at times to use. For me, hand tracking can form part, but not the whole, of cockpit interaction. Using it in combination with a yoke and perhaps throttle quadrant, having it activated for one hand for switches and the like, may well be best fit. And some of the limitations may be a result of Microsoft's implementation of controllers in Microsoft Flight Simulator. From the developer's side, I'd like to see a better hand representation. And the arrow? Well, it's below the hand. I'd like it a lot closer to the fingers. Right now, hand tracking is showing some promise, but not yet ready for prime time in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you found it useful and informative. Stay well. I'll see you again soon. And bye for now.